I met our two presenters tonight, Lin Lee and James Leong, right here in this room earlier this year when they won a Human Rights Press Award for their documentary on Wukan, that little village uh, across the border where they've been experimenting with democracy. That was their second award from the FCC, adding to a clutch that they've won in a decade of filmmaking that has taken them and their viewers from East Timor to Cambodia, North Korea, and the Hong Kong of the players of Homeless FC and other movies of theirs that many of us might not have seen yet. I look forward to a great discussion after the screening, and without further ado, can I ask James to quickly introduce their film tonight? Oh, yeah, please, yeah. Thank, thank you very much for, for coming. Um, Lynn and I recently moved here from Singapore about um, a year ago, and I think both of us always thought that uh, uh, press freedom in Hong Kong was, was very good. Um, I grew up here, and um, uh, for much of my childhood, Lynn worked here as a journalist um, between 2000 and 2002, yeah. But uh, uh, when we arrived, we, we kind of walked into um, what was, what's been described by the Hong Kong Journalist Association as the worst year for, for, for press freedom in Hong Kong. Um, so we went on the uh, uh, February 20, 23rd demonstration uh, in support of press freedom. And three days later, Kevin Lau, the former editor of Ming Bao, was uh, attacked, um, hacked in the street. And uh, we just felt that we ha really had to do something to, 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 to make a, a, a documentary about this. Um, and what, you, what you're going to see now is, is the result of that. Um, well, that's it. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed the movie, and I hope that we, we can now have, you know, your thoughts, your questions. Um, we have, a, we have a Lynn and James willing to stay as long as, as, as any of you are to talk and, and discuss this. So uh, I could start, but uh, if anyone would like to uh, begin the uh, proceedings with a question, I'm, I'm, I will start by just giving a little spoiler here that James and Lynn are actually working on, in, in a way, a sequel to the movie. Is that a spoiler? I'm sorry, you have to keep it confidential then. Um, on uh, Occupy Central, which I think is, uh, is, uh, is going to be ready for October. Um, but uh, I, I was reminded watching that about how a lot of these themes of freedom of the press are tied up with uh, these critical issues for Hong Kong of uh, the, the democratic future for Hong Kong uh, and how we're going to achieve that. But. Um, if I could ask anyone here who, who has a, a question or contribution or, or thought that they'd like to, uh, to raise, the gentleman in the front, uh, if you could just identify yourself and, uh, you know, this is, this is less formal than a lunch talk, you know, let's, this is a, a discussion, let's have a good discussion, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, my name's Stuart Heaver, I'm a freelance journalist based in Hong Kong. I'd just like to uh, thank you very much, first of all, for an absolutely brilliant uh, documentary. My immediate question was, you focused a lot on print media and the potential censorship of print media. So I wanted to ask you, to what extent is the internet Hong Kong's potential antidote to Beijing-inspired censorship? Actually, one of the most influential um, uh, internet kind of sites, uh, blogs, recently closed down the House News. I, I don't know if you've heard about that website, um, they were apparently about to do a tie-up with, uh, was it the Wall Street Journal? With the Wall Street Journal. I think they, were, they, they seemed to be doing okay. Um, and then it closed very suddenly, and, and uh, the, the, the founder, Tony Choi, has not been uh, contactable since. But um, uh, someone who worked very closely with him has, has written a few like, uh, pieces about it, and, and it was a surprise to everyone. Um, uh, actually, maybe I can read on the on the website of the, the House News. There's like a um, the reason why he closed it down, and I I can maybe I can read that. Um, uh, what he says is, um, I fear the current atmosphere of political struggle is extremely unsettling. A number of the Democratic camp members are being stalked, smeared, and having some old stories dug out. A wave of white terror envelops us, envelops the society, and I feel it. 
and as a businessman who often travels up to the mainland, I have to admit, every time I cross the border, I would get just jittery. I might just be paranoid. That feeling is inexplicable to outsiders, but, but, but what unsettles me most is my family also feels this pressure, and they worry about me all the time. That breaks my heart. And I think he'd just been to, up, up to China for a trip, um, and, and when he came back, that's when the, the website was uh, uh, closed down. So, uh, um, yeah, I don't know if uh, online is going to, <laughs> uh, yeah. I think when we were making this documentary, um, the people we spoke to, like Ching Chong, for instance, and even Mark Simon, they were quite optimistic about how the online media would um, neutralize the threat um, that was, um, um, you know, the threat to, to mainstream media. And at the time, I think we were quite optimistic as well. And then more recently, the House News um, closure happened, and I think that, yeah, it's just, it's been a shock. Nick Thompson, no, sorry. Uh, Nick Thompson, no affiliation. Um, what can the average person in Hong Kong do to help? And the perception, from my point of view, of Occupy Hong Kong has been some chaps uh, sitting on armchairs or sofas around the, uh, the pier that goes out to the uh, Star Ferry. And they don't seem to be Hong Kongers. And you know, they just seem to be sitting around smoking. And it doesn't create a very good impression of Occupy Central. Are they anything to do with it? I, I don't know what those guys are. They're, they're, um, I think they're, they're uh, protesting about refugee rights. They're not actually related to the, the Occupy Central movement. Uh, right. the, 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 the trouble is that people seem to assume that they are. Yeah. Uh, and it, 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 it's a shame that Occupy Central is, is getting a bad name, isn't it? You know, it's not the, the pure thing that it was set up to be. Yeah. Well, I think at the moment there's a concerted campaign uh, uh, against Occupy uh, Central. Um, you know, they're speaking the same language. Uh, this is the anti-Occupy uh, Central signature campaign. Um, and it, it feels a little odd because they're speaking the same language, but they're actually um, they're actually trying to kind of um, get people to accept what the Chinese government is going to offer. You know, let's pocket it first, let's accept less. But they're using the, the, the language of um, uh, democracy in order to promote something that, that uh, uh, you could say is anti-democratic, maybe. Um, so I think a lot of the perception of Occupy Central, especially in the last like month or so, has come from this, this group. Um, I think they call themselves the Alliance for Peace and Democracy. I'd like to thank you for that question because, again, one of the reasons that we put on events like this at the FCC is so that we can demonstrate our support for important issues like freedom of the press, but also so we can discuss what, what more it is we, we can do. And, um, you know, the, I, I, I'm going to entirely abuse my position in the chair now because we do have um, uh, Ms. Anson Chan here in the audience, and I want, I'm, I'm gonna ask her whether she has any thoughts about what we as ordinary residents of Hong Kong can do, because not just have we had this terrible incident with the House News, but we've also had, to my mind, just as an observer, this quite disturbing campaign um, against, uh, or, or kind of media kind of frenzy over the leaked Jimmy Lai contributions issue, which, which I have to see as I, I have to interpret myself just as an ordinary reader, as a, as an attack on Apple Daily and what it's trying to do as a journalistic institution. So, if again, to I hope you uh, you forgive me, Ms. Chan, but just given your 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 experience, what are your thoughts on what we as ordinary Hong Kong residents can do to help? Uh, the cause of press freedom in Hong Kong? Um, I have uh, several um, observations. The first, uh, as regards press freedom, I think every one of us need to realize that press freedom isn't something remotely detached from our everyday life. 
if you're a businessman, if you're an ordinary citizen going about your work, anybody in any capacity, you really ought to sit up and take notice about what is going on right under your very nose. You've seen the documentary. You've seen what has happened with the proprietor of House News, who was really one of the main reasons he himself explained why he closed down House News was simply, even if he could take the intimidation himself, he could not take it on behalf of his family. You look at the way that uh, Jimmy Lai's uh, email have all been hacked. They're all out there in the pl public domain. Does the government do anything about questioning why this intrusion into people's privacy? Instead, what you have is a constant stream of innuendos, intimidation, including people like myself who are just trying to make Hong Kong a better place. This insinuation that somehow I've received money from Jimmy Lai and I'm using it to top up my everyday expenses, etc., etc., etc. It takes a very brave person, actually, in today's Hong Kong to stand up and be counted. But I ask you to ask yourself, is this the way that Hong Kong is going to go? Are we all simply going to just capitulate, fold our arms and do nothing? I find it particularly pathetic that the commercial and the business sector does not sit up and take notice. Surely it cannot be in their own commercial interest to see a fettered press. And yet what do you see? You see HSBC, Standard Charter, and Bank of East Asia all giving in to a threat from the liaison office to lift their advertisements from Apple Daily. Well, I ask you to ask yourself one question. If this continues, one of these days, all of us will be reading the two left-wing newspapers, that is Bai Gong and Man Wei, and nothing else. I can only say to you, as I'm trying to do in my own small way, is to stand up and be counted and do not give in to this sort of pressure. Will we succeed? I don't know. But I do know one thing. If you sit back, you fold your arms, and you do nothing, you can be guaranteed 100% failure. If you attempt to do something, even if it is just to speak up and mouth your concern and express your concern, I cannot guarantee you success, but at least you stand a higher chance of succeeding in protecting the Hong Kong that we all love. We want to continue to live in Hong Kong. I'm not worried about my generation. I don't think things will deteriorate to such an extent that I'm forced to leave. But I do worry for my children, and I worry particularly for my grandchildren. Any other contributions or questions from the floor? The lady in the front. Thank you. Uh, this is just a question about your audience. Um, Al Jazeera has emerged as this w wonderful uh, third force in uh, global journalism. Um, but I'm sorry, I don't watch it <laughs> all the time. Uh, how, do you have any idea the, the viewership uh, of this particular episode. Has it already screened or not? Actually, we don't. <laughs> it, it, has, it has screened, and we've had um, emails and questions and things like that. But as to the actual numbers, I, I don't know. We don't know. Yeah, we, we know it's available to 220 million households, but I don't, we don't know how many people watch. I do believe it's actually available free online. So we, uh, so you could uh, share it with your friends if you find it on the website. But I was going to, if I could just follow up on your question, I was going to ask, I'd be, I'm very interested to know what sort of feedback you got on this movie. And um, because as I said earlier, I, I think that you really, with the visual medium, you reach a much broader audience, I think, than you can with the written words. So I'd be very interested whether you've had feedback that you did not expect on the movie and how that may affect your next show about uh, Occupy Central, if at all. I think one of the more interesting responses we got was um, someone saying, um, why are you saying that things are so bad now? Look at how things were pre-handover. 
um, the British didn't do much with democracy or free, um, freedom of speech in Hong Kong. Um, and then it triggered this big debate um, between two people on, on that particular um, page. Um, and actually, when we were interviewing Mr. Xu Xinpoor, he, he said the same thing as well. He said, you have, if you look at what life was like under the British, then you're being hypocritical, accusing um, the Chinese government of not giving Hong Kong enough freedoms because we were not that free under the British. And I think our response to him was, the yardstick shouldn't be what life was like under the British. The yardstick should be what life um, has been like since the handover. And it's clear that there's been a deterioration since the handover. And it doesn't matter, I think, um, if it was not so free under the British, because people don't look back like that. People look at what the situation is right now, and they judge from there. And if um, Hong Kong has gone from being the best in Asia to 61st, then it's clearly something to be concerned about. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for that movie, by the way, uh, to begin with. That was fantastic. Um, I, I do have a question of your selection of material in isolating Hong Kong from, well, ch the China general media climate, maybe, um, especially Guangdong, where you did mention briefly there are opposing voices fighting for the same things. Shouldn't that be bigger part of the debate of Hong Kong, what goes on on the mainland, and maybe why. I can, keep, I can perhaps guess why you didn't focus more on making interviews on the mainland, um, but would, would you not have preferred to make that a bigger part of, of your documentary? Well, what I think, um, uh, you know, one thing is the, the time constraint. We have 25 minutes, and we wanted to focus on the situation in Hong Kong. But um, yeah, I mean, it's it's it is important what's going on, on the mainland, and particularly in in um, in Guangdong, where um, just two years ago we were at the uh, the elections held in Wukan, which was the village um, which uh, overthrew their their village committee um, because of some like really really dodgy land sales, and um, there was a, actually a, a kind of great feeling that this was a kind of new beginning. It was like a sort of spring. Um, and we were covering the elections there, um, and there, I think there were, must have been about two or three hundred uh, reporters from all around the world, including a contingent of maybe a hundred from Hong Kong. Um, and you know, you could really feel there was a lot of media freedom at, at that time. Um, and then we followed this story for uh, a couple of years, and we um, we filmed the the recent election, 2014 election. Um, the one after the 2012 one, and there were perhaps like a dozen foreign reporters there, and the restrictions were quite severe this time round. So it's almost that there was an opening up and then a kind of closing again. Um, you know, to the extent that you you would get followed around when you're walking around the village. You know, um, you see like local journalists there, um, and as soon as like foreign media people go in, they stop filming like what's going on in the elections. They point their cameras at you. So you know you don't really know whether they're like local journalists or or or, 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 um, or part of the the propaganda department. So I think the situation in China is, um, especially recently, has gotten uh, a lot more a lot lot more restrictive, um, and you can really feel it. Um, in Hong Kong, I mean, we've we've actually in filming um, Occupy, uh, the Occupy Central documentary, we've actually had people taking our photographs, which I've never experienced here before. You know, you'll be like, you'll, you'll be filming something. You turn around, there's someone behind you, actually trying to take a snapshot of you, which is more what you'd expect to to, to experience in China. Um, so I think even like every day, practically, uh, from every day working, you, you you kind of notice these these small things happening. You know, slowly, slowly, it's getting kind of eroded more and more until you know one day you'll just you'll just find it's changed completely. Um, so I, I don't know if that really answered the question. I kind of, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Hi, my name is David Coles. I, I'm in education, uh, nothing to do with uh, uh, journalism. However, um, I'm wondering how sanguine people are about the future. 
One of the things which has really encouraged me in recent years and months in Hong Kong has been the rise of interest in mean, young people about political situation, about um, current affairs, about their role and their rights and responsibilities. And I found it immensely encouraging as someone who's been in Hong Kong long enough to know when school children at the secondary level were a lot more timid and the, the, the notion of speaking out was quite alien to them. So I think that's very encouraging. I'm wondering, looking forward, and obviously the FCC is probably not the best place to speculate about the future of print journalism, but you know, if you're on the MTR, or even if I'm in, in Guangzhou on the, the subway there, I don't see too many young people reading newspapers. And yet the ability for them to actually bypass the Great Firewall in China now, I think from talking to young people there, seems to be increasing. So I'm just wondering, um, unless you've got a North Korea, how possible will it be even for mainland China to totally suppress freedom of speech in the medium term? Interesting. I think in July this year they came up with a whole new bunch of rules. Um, very confusing for, for people like us who are trying to do stories in China. Um, you're not allowed to report news that hasn't been publicized by official channels before. So, uh, in other words, unless it's um, it's put out by the government, you're not. That's my. This is my interpretation. You're not supposed to to put it out yourself. Now, how does that work if you're a journalist and you find something out? Um, and then more recently, I, um, um, there's been an attempt to control what goes out on social media. I think you're, um, you're no longer allowed to share news on, on WeChat, for instance. Um, so going back to like when we were in Wuhan two years ago and the young activists there being able to get online, to blog, to to, to use VPN to you know go around the great or go, go over the great firewall um, to what it's like today we we're no longer able to get in touch with the activists that we were in contact with they their phone lines are being monitored their internet accounts are being monitored or shut down have been shut down um, the chat groups have been um, uh, well taken down I think. It's, it's, uh, it's, there's been a significant clamping down in the last two years. Um, uh, there have been arrests, there have been people being intimidated. I think it's a really tough environment. Um, I, personally, we don't think it looks very good in China right now. And I, um, you're right, we think that in Hong Kong, we should be as, especially concerned. Uh, I'm just wondering, with the increasing sophistication of technology and the ability to actually bypass the censorship, whether or not anyone shares any shred of hope for the future in the medium term. If, if I could just quickly interject there, or, or rather respond before James, but of course, we, I, I, I like everyone else, hope that the, the, the children are the future and that technology is the future. But as, as Lynn mentioned, I think that, it's, that we, we've seen some very disturbing trends. I, I work in the print media um, in terms of how technology and the internet can be counted down and controlled, A. But B, even if it was, was not, ultimately one of the very disturbing things that's happened, with, as, as we saw in the film, is at, at the end of the day, even if, if people in China are accessing Apple Daily or the such like online, which young people are all consuming their media online, um, who is creating that content? And if, if the business model is attacked, which is, what is, being ha which is what is happening by reportedly pressure on advertisers, then there is the, the, that, that's the, the, you know, the, the people who don't want the bad stories to come out are attacking it on every level. So even if there wasn't an ability to control or, or, or censor the internet, um, where's that content going to come from? Um, uh, this is not the time or place to have a discussion about you know, the, the, the challenges facing journalism full stop, but uh, I, 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 do, I, I, I take 
and we had a discussion earlier, the, 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 the panelists, with uh, Ms. Chan about how wonderful it is to see what uh, you know, the uh, scholarism and the other young activists are, are doing, and that's a great testament to what Hong Kong has achieved. And uh, I have a lot of optimism about that as well. But um, in, in terms of technology and, uh, and the other issues, I, I'm not so sure. James, sorry, I interrupted. You were going to respond to it. I mean, the scholars have managed to stop the, the national curriculum from coming in 2012. It's a pretty, pretty big achievement, I think. Um, but I think it also depends what line the, the central government takes. And it seems like in the last year they've decided to really take a very hard line. And uh, and I, you know, um, young people in Hong Kong, I'm not sure um, what they can do to to stand up for that. I hope they can. I hope we can. But, uh, So, uh, based on the research you've done for, for um, this one that you just shown and the, <clears throat> the one that's coming up about Occupy Central, um, you to try to look in a glass ball um, leading the two or three years leading up to 2017. How do you think this is going to play out? Um, first of all, when it comes to uh, press freedom, do you think this is going to be this continued drip, drip erosion of press freedoms? What's the best guess, the best scenario among people that you've interviewed? or the most likely scenarios? I, I, I think that um, uh, Apple Media will continue to be under attack. Um, they'll, they'll try to, to uh, uh, muzzle the, the few voices that are still uh, speaking up. There may be like blogs online which still are able to speak up, but um, um, in terms of the news industry, I think it's, it's a, a, a going to be more and more of like a steady erosion, really. That's my, that's what I think. Oh, thanks for that. I really um, wasn't so much aware of the personal danger that so many of those journalists faced. So I thought that was really brought home in your documentary. Well done on that. And my question is sort of following on from that is, What's your take on the law and order side of the story? Do you think that the police and the courts have any kind of power to help prevent this or bring justice to these people? Bring justice to... Uh, it's really hard to tell. Um, there's a lot of speculation going on. Um, a lot of us, I think, believe that he was attacked for his work as a journalist. But I think it's pretty clear, judging from what police and the me and and um, have said in the media so far, that they're not making. They're trying to not make that connection, and without speculating too much, um, it's hard to think that there would be any other reason to go after him. Um, he was, part of a, he was part of a, a consortium of journalists. I think there was some in Australia and in Taiwan as well, maybe. Is all over the world. All over the world. They were the international. They investigated the leaked documents. They were they were looking into the um, the offshore accounts of of, uh, of the Chinese leaders. You know how money was being kind of put away in these in these. Uh, uh, that's like just speculation uh, as to you know, whether that was the reason he was. If I may, just to respond, and other people in the audience may have some thoughts about your question as well, and please, if, you know, if they, if they do, this is an open discussion as well. I'm sure James and they would love to hear other people's thoughts. But just in, in, in specific response to your question, I mean, we've had we've had uh, the chief executive and the chief secretary here, and uh, to talk to us about the, uh, the 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 importance that they 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 place in freedom of the press and why they think it's important and a core value of Hong Kong's. And uh, of course, after the attack on Kevin Lau, they came out very strongly, and I think rightly, and uh, you know, we're all glad to see how strongly they came out. And um, I, I, if, if justice, you know, the, the course, the prop, one of the challenges with the attack is, I think like Mike, Mark Simon said in your movie, it was more likely to be a situation, in my opinion, as he said, of people bringing gifts to Caesar or, you know, in a 
another kind of analogy, you know, the Archbishop of Canterbury who's going to rid me of this pesky priest kind of situation, rather than a specific order from the liaison office that we don't like, Kevin Lau, and we're going to hack him. So, but, so bringing to justice, I mean, they've already arrested people. There will be people jailed, but will we ever know who was the, who, who, whose great idea it was to do that horrible thing? I don't know. And again, if, if anyone has any thoughts or contributions, please. Um. The other journalists that you interviewed, sorry, the, the other journalists you interviewed, did you get a sense of uh, fear or, I mean, are they, I mean, you have to really be worried about your, not only your livelihood, but your life. Um, you know, you'd expect when you're making a documentary about press freedom that a lot of journalists want to talk and share their ideas and views with you. We actually had trouble getting people to talk to us, some people, because of fear. Um, people were afraid to, to be too upfront. Um, there were people who declined um, our requests because they didn't want to affect their livelihoods. Um, so I think, I think you, you know, when when you're trying to control the press. And I come from Singapore, where the press is very different from what it is here. Um, you don't really need to do a lot. You just need to make sure that enough people are fearful and start checking themselves, and then you know you would be able to create a situation where um, the press is not so free. Um, so making this, um, yeah, we've seen what fear does, has done to some journalists in Hong Kong. Um, it's understandable, but it's also very sad. Um, yeah, and it's something to think about. And I think, I think it's good that, um, you know, clubs like the FCC are standing up, but I, we kind of feel that with more fear with more more um more rules in china people will start here will start thinking that okay maybe i shouldn't overstep certain boundaries and not speak up so much well, i've already said something but um i guess uh, uh, two points. One, um, I've been uh, uh, I've been really astonished at the way the uh, at the way business and the professions have gotten off basically scot free uh, in their condemnations in their their sort of I'm sorry gangbang of of Occupy Central. Uh, it's been reported in the international press, but no one has put the the, the Different threads together, and made a even a, a single. I haven't seen it at least a single sharp editorial saying, "What the hell is international business doing in Hong Kong, going along with this uh, sort of um, attack, the the attack on Occupy Central, uh, which basically amounts to calling." To, to claiming that Occupy Central is about violence. That's the, uh, the uh, August 17th um, act actions are all playing up the notion that Occupy Central is about violence. When those poor people have been saying from day one they're about civil disobedience. And a, a sit-in, uh, even of 10,000 people somewhere in Central, is very different from violence. I, so this is really a question for the international media. Why haven't they come out more strongly against this? I, the rule of law, as, as you uh, caught the people, the uh, hedge fund manager and, and his associates who are supporting Occupy Central, they made the very valid point that the free flow of information is vital to markets and censorship uh, runs against that. And that's a, a point that you can make more broadly uh, about 
Occupy Central and, and the business opposition to it. So, I, so I'm sort of looking at you, Doug. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's really my question. Why have they gotten such a free, why has business gotten such a free ride on this? I, I think they're disgraceful. I, I mean, they, big business, the accountancy firms, the rest of them, HS, I didn't realize that HSBC, Stand Chart, and Bank of East Asia were all pulling ads from Apple Daily. But it's, it's really uh, shocking. I'm happy to respond to that, but before I do, are there any other kind of contributions that, so that we can take a, a, a bunch of them or, or thoughts? Question, right? Please. Did you try to talk to anyone in the business community? Do you want to take that first? And yeah. then um, Ed, Edward Chin, the, the, he, he's, uh, he's in the business community, he's a hedge fund manager. And his group of uh, about 70 um, people are also in the, the, the finance industry. So um, I think we, we wanted to talk to, to, to someone in business to find out what they thought about freedom of the press. And, and, um, and you know, that was really the, the point about the free flow of information and how that's important for people to make business decisions. You know, if you don't have the right kind of information, then your business is going to suffer. And I, I, I agree. I think, um, I think, uh, uh, people are like you know cutting off their noses in spite of their faces. It's uh, uh, it's a real shame to see this happening. And and there's a strange kind of um, a sort of uh, uh, a travesty, if, if you will, where, where 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 people are kind of getting dressed up in the in the clothing of uh, of democracy of free speech, um, um, but the intention is to is in the end to to, to stifle those things. Um, and I think you can see it as well with uh, with the hacking into into Mark Simon's email accounts recently as well. Um, so many people like uh, uh, you, you go online, you look at uh, uh, comments, and, and so many people like uh, you know gleefully uh, um, uh, attacking uh, him and, and attacking uh, many in the uh, uh, democracy, the uh, pan democrats. Um, but do you, I mean, do we really want to live in a place where someone can go into your computer, steal your private correspondence, and then when you've done nothing illegal, give that to the press and for your reputation to be smeared, to be mud slung at you? You know, I mean, to me, and, and yet that is being kind of defended as, as you know, freedom of the press. Uh, to me, it's, uh, it's, it's just crazy. It's the whole thing is kind of the wrong way around. And I think also, you know, if we want to live in that kind of society, then you are cutting off the nose and spite your faces because, you know, the minute that someone doesn't like what you stand for, like they don't like what you realize light stands for, they can do the same thing to you. So, you know, to me, it's, uh, uh, it doesn't make any sense, but, uh, yeah. Um, I think they reported it to the police just last Wednesday and they're now starting to, uh, to investigate. Um, that's, that's as far as I know. Um, so, so I think it's under police investigation now. Yeah. Uh, having worked for a few financial institutions, they're just treating Occupy Central like basically a terrorist attack. You know, it goes to their contingency planning. Uh, it's a bit like when we did um, uh, the, the year 2000 thing. I, I, I was told by the company I was working for at that time that if all of the banks go down, that is not a problem. But if our bank goes down and everybody else is trading, that's a big problem. And, and this is the way they're treating Occupy Central at the moment, mm -hmm. that it's, a, it's an inconvenience and we've got to have contingency plans in place to overcome that problem, mm -hmm. rather than thinking, why Occupy Central? Mm -hmm. You know, shouldn't, shouldn't we be supporting it in principle? Mm -hmm. um, and none of them seem to have done that. Um. Just to, to respond to, I think, the question that was put to me earlier, and purely in my position as a former president of the FCC, I guess I have, um, uh, I, I, I have read in the international media editorials uh, criticizing, for example, the, uh, the Hong Kong affiliates of the big four accounting firms for their position on Occupy Central. Um, and uh, I, I think uh, you know that there have been reports in the international media which have, have talked about some of the things that you've mentioned. But uh, you know, as a journalist uh, who uh, who talks to financial institutions, international financial institutions, I, I mean, clearly, what 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 are what are what are 
our, our audience member said just now is is entirely true. I, mean, I think I think that it's it just just as it is for local media, for international media, for any business. You know, one of the big things that we are all dealing with is China is going to be the large, the most. You know, it, China is is Rome to America's Greece. How how are we going? How, how every company in the world is is trying to work out how to cope with that and you know Hong Kong is the canary in the coal mine I think that is really kind of chirping away and doing the hard heavy lifting for the rest of the world and fighting the good fight and I think that that's why we sh I'm so proud to be an adopted Hong Konger we all hope the canary doesn't die um, I, I, you know, it's it's coming close to nine. I, I, you know, I don't know, Lynn, James. I mean, are you happy to continue as long as people are? I mean, I don't want to keep anyone, but uh, we uh, we're, we're we're very happy to keep this going here. Or we could, some of us could adjourn downstairs. Please, if anyone would like to ask something, raise something. Yep, please. And then the lady in the front. Hello, I had. I I just wanted to say something I feel slightly uncomfortable about this discussion, which on the whole is, has been very informative and very engaging, that it's beginning to sound a little bit provincial. And when you say that the um, Hong Kong is the uh, canary in the cage, I'd like to know what other people's impressions are about where, whether anybody else in the world is interested in what happens to that canary. Um, you know, there's not a lot of democracy going on in Moscow, in uh, South America. There's lots of other places where there's huge challenges for freedom of speech and press freedom. Uh, there are journalists going to jail in London uh, because the state doesn't like the way they've, in, they, they've transacted their business. So without extending the whole of the discussion to journalism in the world today, I, didn't, I just felt slightly uncomfortable about getting a bit too, let's look at one canary, because I'm not sure the rest of the world's bothered about Hong Kong's canary one way or the other, I'm afraid. It's always a mistake when I talk, but uh, sorry. Uh, for, could I, uh, Ms. Champ? The American Congress and the uh, State Department, they are concerned about Hong Kong. They're concerned about Hong Kong, not just, you know, Hong Kong being what it is, but I think they see it as their own, in their own self-interest to maintain Hong Kong's core values, to protect their investments here. They have nationals here, they invest. And let's not forget, we have signed a whole raft of international agreements with countries like America, with the UK, with European countries, all of which are based on the assumption that we have a very distinct system in Hong Kong that is totally different from the rest of China. And if two systems no longer exist, then it puts at risk Hong Kong's ability to honor those obligations. And those obligations matter to other countries. Why? Because we cooperate in uh, human tra preventing human trafficking, narcotics, protection of intellectual property rights, etc., etc. And the impression we got after seeing people in the State Department and the Vice President is that America now realizes that at the end of the day, they are talking about protecting their own core values, which we happen to share. And so, in order to protect that, with an increasingly strong and aggressive China, I have the impression that the American government is at least prepared from time to time to put at risk that relationship with China in order to emphasize and to protect their core values. This is what we want to see in other countries that trade with Hong Kong. So, I'm not as pessimistic as you are. But it does mean we have to keep on trying to make sure that we remain on the radar of our trading partners. It won't happen otherwise. Just, just very quickly, I apologize because every time I speak, I, I, I kind of divert us. But uh, I brought up the issue of, uh, that, that you criticized as, uh, that you pointed out could be, could be taken as parochial. But um, the, the, uh, a colleague of ours from uh, Fairfax wrote a fantastic piece about why Hong Kong matters. And uh, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to plagiarize that, or rather recognize that. But his argument was this. What, what's happening in Hong Kong now it could be, it is, is, 
and, and the potential lack of fulfillment of the commitments that China made under a legally binding international agreement, the Joint Declaration, is of critical importance to, 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 to the rest of Asia and to the rest of the world. This is not to say that there's not horrible things happening in terms of freedom of the press around the world. There are a lot. Um, but I, you know, I, I'm a Malaysian. My country, all the other countries in Asia, are going to have to come to terms and work. And every business in the world, and everyone in the world, is going to have to come to terms with how we work with China. And if if uh, and Hong Kong is standing up, the Hong Kongers are standing up for the commitments that China made regarding Hong Kong in an international agreement. And and that's why I don't think it's as parochial as it could be criticized to be. So I'm going to stop now, and there's another question from the lady here in front. Um, I'll perhaps bring the temperature down a bit. Mine's not a question, just an observation, really. Um, I'm a media teacher, and I have to teach news to uh, 14, 15, 16-year-olds, and later teach um, broadcast journalism and documentary making to older students. And um, they, you know, as soon as you say, oh, so we're doing a unit on news, you know, you can see them all sort of opening up chat and everything else. It is hard to engage them, but what they do have um, a very strong sense of is um, justice. Um, I often find they're quite engaged when um, I talk about, um, uh, you know, how journalists, you know, put their own lives in danger often. And I, I use international extreme examples, um, you know, of, of people who have lost their lives. Um, and really your film is a gift because, for me, because um, it's always quite hard to bring it to a local level for them. Um, so I certainly plan to use your film in the classroom. So thank you very much. Just take a few more rounding up uh, comments, contributions, and then give Lynn and James the last word before I offer to buy anyone a drink downstairs who would like a drink. Yeah, I'd just like to comment on a certain comment that was made by a member of the audience regarding uh, people being locked up in London in jails, journalists. Um, if they have broken the law, as they seem to have done, and it's been an open case, I think it's right that they're, they're jailed. I don't see anything wrong with that, and I'm, I'm very sad to see it being included in this discussion. It's, it's hardly like the same as the Al Jazeera guys in uh, Egypt. I'm not sure what our friend was referring to, but it's a kind of reference. Right. Any, any other uh, final comments, contributions, before a final word to Lynn and James? Okay. I just want to say that as a long-time admirer of the freedoms that Hong, of, that Hong Kongers enjoy. Um, and as now uh, someone living and working in Hong Kong, I really hope that not just journalists, but residents here will, will stand up and try and do something to protect these freedoms. Because you don't know what it's like until you, you lose them. And they're worth protecting. They're worth standing up for. Um, yeah, they're really valuable. Completely agree. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a round of applause for our filmmakers.